Don in London, hello. My video for March 11, all about recovery from addiction to either substance or behaviour. My addictive substance was alcohol. My behaviour could be equally, equally addictive around people, places and things. And these days, I don't drink one day at a time and I try not to obsess about people, places and things one day at a time. All good and this is courtesy of family, community, medical people and a fellowship and that fellowship is AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, which is where I focus in these videos. How does AA help me on a daily basis? And it's through meetings of AA, what you see is what you get on a daily basis, good and bad. And there is no such thing as a bad meeting for me because all meetings mean something. They trigger off something in me to do with my feelings and how I deal with reality. I don't speak for AA, never can, never can, never will, never want to. AA is full of unique authentic people who choose to share their message of experience, strength and hope where they will. Some in the public domain, some privately or within meetings where anonymity is sacrosanct. For me anonymity is as important as it can be in terms of confidentiality that you would expect of your doctor, your priest or your confidant. So we know in fellowship that gossip kills. So I try as best I can never to reveal anything about other people by name or by intention and so far I feel I've actually been able to do that. So yes, the fellowship, anonymity, all important and I don't speak for it, I just speak for myself and how AA helps me day by day. And the backbone of that is meetings, but when I can't get to a meeting I use the literature of AA and I also utilise the telephone so I can speak to people who know the malady of alcoholism and where it takes a person emotionally and spiritually. So emotionally, if my feelings fit the day I'm having, that is, my emotions seem to fit the experience of now, then all well and good. But if my emotions are over the top in some way, either overly happy or overly sad, or raging and angry or something like that it probably means that I'm out of balance and out of balance is where the extremes of character defects as they are called tend to manifest so either we can have euphoria or absolute extreme sadness or anger or resentment and when that happens it's time to get to a meeting or phone somebody or just stop ask myself, am I hungry, angry, lonely or tired and what's going on for me? So the fellowship has taught me some very useful life skills and that's the reason why I share experience, strength and hope by these videos. About life skills I guess, <coughs> which have got a bit of a bad name because a lot of people have been trying to train people on life skills when they don't have them themselves. So we're only as good as the day on which we present and uh, that's me too. So some days good, sometimes sometimes not so good. Anyway, what is AA and how does it help me? I share the AA preamble and I want to talk about one of the chapters in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organisation or institution. It does not wish to engage in any controversy. Neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. <coughs> a bit of a tall order if you try to do it on your own. And what we find in fellowship more than anything is we lean on the many in order to keep sober and that's why meetings are so important so if we go to a meeting we hear many people speak and not just one person like here on the video so it is the many voices which give us the wisdom to find our path on a daily basis and the book of AA Alcoholics Anonymous this one the big book as it's called 
is packed full of wisdom, which any um, any practicing alcoholic doesn't want to hear. Simply because when we're in the malady, we prefer to shun the world, stay isolated, or pretend we're all right. So one of the major character defects I had during my drinking time at the end, when it got to 24/7 and I just couldn't stop doing it, was uh, isolated fear of everything, putting on a brave face when I went out to find some more drink, and a very brittle ego keeping me away from the world. But if you ask me how I was, either I would tell you and fall down you know, or break down, or I would say, get lost, leave me alone. And often we see people in that state where they just don't want to know us because it's just too hard to express anything. So in this book, AA, chapter 3, all, more about alcoholism. I'm going to share it and see how it goes. More about alcoholism, chapter 3. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterised by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. And for me, being taken to an intensive care unit at the time, I just didn't realise how ill I was. And I was very gung-ho, and I laughed and joked about my situation. But it was desperately, desperately close to an ending. We, were, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we were like other people, or presently may be, has to be smashed. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt, at times, that we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period we get worse, never better. We are like men who have, have lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which would make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried every manageable remedy. In some instances there has been brief recovery, followed always by still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet. And the problem is, if we rely on science to fix us, we're looking for a fix. Simple as that. And as it seems to be a malady or an illness of emotions and spirit, spirit in the sense of our spiritual connection to reality, how on earth can a pill fix us completely? Or how on earth can science fix emotions? That's what we were doing with alcohol. Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they are in that class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. If anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. Heaven knows we have tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. Here are some of the methods we have tried. Drinking beer only. Limiting the number of drinks. Never drinking alone. Never drinking in the morning. Drinking only at home. Never having it in the house. Never drinking during business hours. Drinking only at parties. Switching from scotch to brandy. Drinking only natural wines. Agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job. Taking a trip. Not taking a trip. Swearing off forever. With and without a solemn, a solemn oath taking physical exercise, reading inspirational books, going to health farms and sanitariums, accepting voluntary commitment to asylums. We could increase the list ad infinitum. And I tried all those things, but I didn't know I was trying them. 
I would swear off on a Sunday, and by Sunday night I'd be at the bar or the off license having one or two just to steady my nerves to get ready for the working week. And worse, when I was working weekends mainly, as well as during the week. I would never swear off, because I needed it to blot out reality, the reality of my situation, continually doing something over and over again which was not worthy and did not fulfil any sort of emotional sense of well-being, namely the work I did. I might have been good at it, but it didn't mean I ought to be doing it. So not only do we find in recovery that we were doing things to alleviate the problem and find oblivion, we also found probably in recovery that we needed to change our whole career. We do not like to pronounce any, any individual as alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over to the nearest bar room and try to, some controlled drinking. Try to drink and stop abruptly. Try it more than once. It will, take a, it will not take you long for you to decide if you, are, if you are honest with yourself about it. It may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. Though there is no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers most of us could have stopped drinking, but the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. We have heard of a few instances where people who showed definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period because of an overpowering desire to do so. Here is one. A man of thirty was doing a great deal of spree drinking. He was very nervous in the morning after these bouts and quieted himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but saw that he could get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and had retired, he would not touch another drop. An exceptional man, he remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. Then he fell victim to a belief which practically every alcoholic has, that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. Out came his carpet slippers and a bottle. In two months he was in hospital, puzzled and humiliated. He tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several, several trips to the hospital meantime. Then, gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop altogether and found he could not. Every means of solving his problem, which money could buy, was at, it was at his disposal. Every attempt failed. Though a robust man at retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. And when you think about it, four years of trying to stop is a horror. But many alcoholics, and me in my case, I don't know how many years I really thought there might be a problem, but denied it and kept on going and it kept me doing things which were not good for me like the type of career I had and it's only with the benefit of hindsight I see that. This case contains a powerful lesson. Most of us have believed that if we remained sober for a long stretch we could thereafter drink normally but here is a man who at 55 years found he was just where he had left off at 30. We have seen the truth demonstrated again and again once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we are in a short time as bad as ever. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. And it took me years to understand that. And that's a horror in itself again. And this whole feeling that we are in charge and can control some things, beyond uh, reasonable doubt, we are fooling ourselves often. I, well, I can only speak for me. I was certainly fooling myself because I would go dry for a long, long time. And then when I started drinking, I sought what I looked for before. That was oblivion. Young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think they can stop as he did on their own willpower. We doubt if any of them can do it because none will really want to stop and hardly one of them because of a particular mental twist already acquired we will find he can win out. Several of our cried, sorry, several of our crowd, men of 30 or less, have been drinking only a few years, but they found themselves as helpless as those who have been drinking for 20 years. 
To be greatly affected, one does not necessarily have to drink a long time, nor take the quantities that some of, the, some of us have. This is partic particularly true of women. <coughs> well, I don't know about that. I think men and women are equal in this, in the terms of the malady. But anyway, continuing. Potential female alcoholics often turn into the real thing, and they are gone beyond recall in a few years. Certain drinkers who would be greatly insulted if called alcoholics are astonished at their inability to stop. We who are familiar with the symptoms see large numbers of potential alcoholics among young people everywhere. So, what do I know now? Well, there are so many young people in the fellowship around where I live in, the, in London, UK, and it is gratifying to see that they stay sober and they understand the malady far better than I ever did at their age. In fact, nobody understood it, as far as I could see. As we look back, we feel we had gone on drinking many years beyond the point where we could quit on our own willpower. If anyone questions whether he has entered this dangerous area, let him try leaving liquor alone for a year. If he is a real alcoholic and very far advanced, there is scant, scant chance of success. In early days of our drinking, we occasionally remained sober for a year or more. I did that. Becoming serious drinkers again later, I did that. Though you may be able to stop for a considerable period, you may yet be a potential alcoholic. We think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. And this is the point I was making. We think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. Some will be drunk the day after, making their resolutions, most of them within a few weeks. And for me, I did try doing it for over a year. The advice was, don't drink and see if we can help you with your depression. And the outcome was, I stayed dry for a year, was depressed, and then found a drink and had more and more and more. And it made me more depressed. So from clinical dep depression down into God knows what desolation to a place where I wouldn't wish anybody, not even my worst enemy. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We are assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop, and if it asked me up until the last day, do you really want to stop? I would say yes, but in my head, deep down, I would say no. Hence the uh, thing about denial. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Many of us felt that we had plenty of character. There was tr a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it, this utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. And, as, it, as I found out, it is an emotional and spiritual malady. As well as, of course, the addiction to the liquor itself, whilst we're still taking it. How then shall we help our readers determine, to their own satisfaction, whether they are one of us? The experiment of quitting for a long period of time will be helpful, but we think we can render an even greater service to alcoholic sufferers and perhaps to the medical fraternity. So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem. So what makes us relapse? I'm sure anybody watching this who is an alcoholic has many reasons and understanding as to why. So here we go. <clears throat> What sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy are mystified when he walks directly into a, a saloon. Why does he? Or what is he thinking? And that's it. What am I thinking when I do that? Of course, of our first example is a friend we shall call Jim. This man has a charming wife and family he, iner he inherited a lucrative automobile agency. He had a commendable war record. He is a good salesman. Everybody likes him. He is an intelligent man, normal so far as we can see, except for a nervous disposition. 
he did no drinking until he was thirty-five. In a few years he became so violent when intoxicated that he had to be committed. On leaving the asylum he came into contact with us. We told him what we know of alcoholism and the answer we had found. He made a beginning. His family were reassembled and he began to work as a salesman for the business he had lost through drinking. All went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. To his consternation he found himself drunk half a dozen times in rapid succession. On each of these occasions we worked with him, reviewing carefully what had happened. He agreed he was an alcoholic and in a serious condition. He knew he faced another trip to the asylum if he kept on. Moreover, he would lose his family for whom he had a deep affection. Yet, he still got drunk again. We asked him to tell us exactly how it happened. This is his story. I came to work on Tuesday morning. I remember I felt irritated that I had to be a salesman for a concern I once owned. I had a few words with the boss, but nothing serious. Then I decided to drive into the country and see one of my prospects for a car. On the way I felt hungry, so I stopped at a roadside place where they have a bar. I had no intention of drinking. I just thought I would get a sandwich. I also had the notion that I might find a customer for a car at this place, which was familiar for I had been going, in to, going to it for many years. I had, he I had eaten there many times during the months I was sober. I sat down at a table and ordered a sandwich and a glass of milk. Still no thought of drinking, I ordered another sandwich and decided to have another glass of milk. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind that if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. I ordered a whiskey and poured it into the milk. I vaguely sensed I was not being any too smart, but felt reassured I was taking the whiskey on a full stomach. The experiment went so well that I ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. Thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim. He was the here was the threat of commitment, the loss of family and position, to say nothing of that intense mental and physical suffering which drinking always caused him. He had much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic, yet all reasons for not drinking were easily pushed aside in favour of the foolish idea that he could make take whisky if only he mixed it with milk. Yeah, well what have we mixed alcohol with over the years? Whatever the price the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? And it is the insanity of thinking it will be different yet again. You may think this is an extreme case. To us it is not. Far-fetched. For this kind of thinking has been characterized, characteristic of every single one of us. We have sometimes reflected more than Jim did upon the consequences, but there was always the curious mental phenomenon that parallel with our, uh, our sound reasoning there inevitably ran some insanely trivial excuse for taking the first drink, or going out with a new girl, uh, she's having a drink, and well why shouldn't I, it won't, one won't hurt will it, and that was insane, our sound reasoning failed to hold us in check, the insane idea won out next day we would ask ourselves, in all earnestness and sincerity, how could it have happened again? And it was the same old, same old. Yes, I felt okay for the night and whatever might have transpired, but in the morning I didn't know myself any more than anyone else. In some circumstances we have gone out deliberately to get drunk, feeling ourselves justified by nervousness, anger, worry, depression, jealousy or the like, or just desperate to be normal. But even in this type of beginning we are obliged to admit that our justification for a spree was insanely insufficient in the light of what always happened. We now see that when we, begin, when we began to drink deliberately instead of casually, there was little serious or effective thought during the period of premeditation of what the terrific consequences might be. So we don't think it out, we don't think about the consequences, and often we ask ourselves, today, sober people, if we do this, what will be the consequences? So we stop long enough to respond, or phone a friend. 
Our behaviour is as absurd and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink as that of an individual with a passion, say, for jaywalking. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles. He enjoys himself for a few weeks in spite of friendly warnings. Up to this point, you would label him as foolish, as a foolish chap having queer ideas of fun. Luck then deserts him, and he is slightly injured several times in succession. You would expect him, if he were normal, to cut it out. Presently, he is hit again, and, on, and this time he has a fractured skull. Within a week after leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. He tells you he has decided to stop jaywalking for good, but in a few weeks he breaks both legs. And, you know, that's what we do with alcohol. Uh, it's the thing of taking the edge off. Everybody else is doing. It's legal. It's okay. I'll be all right. Uh, it won't be the same as last time. And that's the insanity of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting something different to happen. I guess we'd be sometimes lucky if we just broke our legs. On through the years, this conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful or to keep up the streets altogether. This is the jaywalker. Finally, it can find no, he can, finally, he can no longer work. His wife gets a divorce, and he is held up to ridicule. He tries every known means to get the jaywalking idea out of his head. He shuts himself up in an asylum, hoping to mend his ways. But the day he comes out, he races in front of a fire engine, which breaks his back. Such a man would be crazy, wouldn't he? You may think our illustration is too ridiculous, but is it? We who have been through the ringer have to admit, if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. However intelligent we may be, what may have been, in other respects, where alcohol is concerned, or has been involved, we have been strangely insane. It's lack its strong language, but isn't it true? And the idea is, why on earth would I keep on going back to hurt myself? Why on earth would I keep on doing these things to myself? And the simple answer is, the madness or the malady of trying it over and over again, just to be normal. And that's frightening. Some of you are thinking, yes, what, what you tell us is true, but is, it, is, it doesn't fully apply. We admit we have some of these symptoms, but we have not gone to the extremes you, you fellows did. Nor are we likely to, for we understand ourselves so well after what you've told us that such things cannot happen again. We have not lost everything in life through drinking, and we certainly do not intend to. Thanks for the information. Now, if I had had that information sooner rather than later, it wouldn't have made any difference because the malady had taken me to a place where I couldn't reason when it came to alcohol. That may be true of certain non-alcoholic people who, though dr drinking foolishly and heavily at the present time, are able to stop or moderate because their brains and bodies have not been damaged as ours, ours were. But the actual or potential alcoholic, with hardly an exception, will absolutely will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. This is a point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize, to smash home upon our alcoholic readers as it had been revealed to us out of our bitter experience. Let us take another illustration. So self-knowledge avails us nothing. So it took me a long time to actually realize that no matter how smart I might be, or intellectually gifted, or just have common sense and gumption, it didn't seem to work when it came to alcohol. There was a fatal flaw in me. I wouldn't look in the mirror and understand it, because it couldn't be me. Fred is partner in a well-known accounting firm. His income is good, he has a fine house. He's happily married, and the father, father of promising children of college age. He has so he has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. If ever there was a successful businessman, it is Fred. To all appearances, he is stable, well a well. He is a stable, well-balanced individual. Yet he is alcoholic, 
We first saw Fred about a year ago in a hospital where he had gone to recover from a bad case of jitters. It was his first experience of this kind, and he was much ashamed of it. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. The doctor intimated strongly that he might be worse than he realised. For a few days he was depressed about his condition. He made up his mind to quit drinking altogether. It never occurred to him that perhaps he could not do so, in spite of his character and standing. Fred would not believe himself an alcoholic, much less accept a spiritual remedy for his problem. We told him what we knew about alcoholism. He was interested and conceded that he had some of the symptoms, but he was a long way from admitting that he could do nothing about it himself. He was, a posit he was positive that his humiliating experience, plus the knowledge he had acquired, would keep him sober the rest of his life. Self-knowledge would fix it. We heard no more of Fred for a while. One day we were told that he was back, back in the hospital. This time he was quite shaky. He soon indicated he was anxious to see us. The story he told is most instructive. For here was a chap absolutely convinced he had to stop drinking, who had no excuse for drinking, who exhi exhibited splendid judgment and determination in all these other concerns. Yet he was flat on his back, nevertheless. Let him tell you about it. I was much impressed with what you fellows said about alcoholism and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. I rather appreciated your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink, but I was confident it could not happen to me after what I had learned. I reasoned I was not so far advanced as most of you fellows, that I had been usually successful in licking my other personal problems, and that I would therefore be successful when you men, where you men failed. I felt I had every right to be self-confident that it would be only a matter of, ex matter of exercising my willpower and keeping on my guard. In this frame of mind I went about my business and for a time all was well. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been masking too, making, too much hard, making too hard work of a simple matter. One day I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. I had been out of town before during this particular dry spell, so there was nothing new about it. Physically I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, a couple of cocktail the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all. Nothing more. I ordered a cocktail and my meal. Then I ordered another cocktail. After dinner I decided to take a walk. When I returned to the hotel it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed, so I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night, and plenty next morning. I have a shadowy recollection of being in an aeroplane bound for New York, and of finding a friendly taxicab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days. I, kn I know little of where I went, what I said and did. Then came the hospital with unbearable mental and physical suffering. As soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time I had not thought of the consequences at all. I commenced to drink as carelessly as though the cocktails were ginger ale. I now remembered what my alcoholic friends had told me, how they had prophesied that if I had, that if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and place would come, I would drink again. They said that though I did raise a defence, it would be one day it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. Well just that well, just that did happen, and more, for what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. I knew from that moment that I had an alcoholic mind. 
I saw that with, I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. I had never been able to understand people who said that a problem that a problem had them hopelessly defeated. I knew then it was a crushing blow. And for me, it didn't seem like a crushing blow. It just seemed like a relief. Thank God I know I am an alcoholic. Two of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous came to see me. They grinned, which I did not like so much. Yeah, I wouldn't have liked it. I'd have told them where to go. And then asked me if I thought myself alcoholic and if I totally, if, if I were really licked this time. I had to concede both propositions. They piled upon me heaps of evidence to the effect that an alcoholic mentally, that an alcoholic mentality, such as I exhibited in Washington, was a hopeless condition. They cited cases out of their own experience by the dozen. This process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. Yeah, and it took me a while to realise that no amount of self-willpower, self-will will fail, I've discovered, because self-will becomes self-obsession and then self-will run riot to the extremes and in a happy uh, or ecstatic frame of mind there is danger and at the low ebb of uh, depression and desolation there is also danger then they outlined the spiritual answer and program of action which a hundred of them had followed successfully though I had been only a nominal churchman their proposals were not intellectually hard to swallow but the program of action though entirely sensible was pretty drastic it meant that I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out of the window. And that was not easy. But the moment I made up my mind to go through the, with the process, I had the curious feeling that my alcoholic condition was relieved, as in fact it proved to be. Quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. And uh, as one clergyman, recent, an archbishop actually said it, when asked what is spiritual, he reflected and said, it's the ability to cope with reality. I have since been brought into a way of li living infinitely more satisfying and, I hope, more useful than the life I've lived before. My old manner of life was by no means a bad one, but I would not exchange its best moments for the worst I have now. I would not go back to it even if I could. And I feel like that too. Fred's story speaks for itself. We hope it strikes home to thousands like him. He had felt only the first nip of the ringer. <laughs> I'm smiling here because uh, I went through the ringer a few times simply because I was defiant, stubborn and thought I could do it on my own. And what I've learned is fellowship is the key. Most alcoholics have to be pretty badly mangled before they really commence to solve their problems. And you know what? For me, I'm not the worst example. I'm just an average example. Many doctors and psychiatrists agree with our conclusions. One of these men, staff member of a world-renowned hospital, recently made this statement to some of us. What you say about the gen general hopelessness of the average alcoholic's plight is, in my opinion, correct. As to two of you, two of you men whose stories I have heard, there is no doubt in my mind that you are 100% hopeless apart from divine help. Had you offered yourselves as patients at this hospital, I would not have taken you, if I had been able to avoid it. People like you are too heartbreaking. Though not a religious person, I have a profound respect for the spiritual approach in such cases as yours. For most cases, there is virtually no other solution. Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defence against the first drink except in a few rare cases neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defence his defence must come from a higher power that's the end of chapter 3 and it's important for me to st state that it's the higher power that you come to understand whether it's based in your faith and your religion or whether it's based in just plain faith or the courage to keep on changing and be a part of living reality as it is today. 
so emotional right feelings right sized for the right experience for the experience we're having and spiritually spiritual as a religious leader suggested and I feel that it works for me too is the ability to cope with reality so everything is spiritual even all the drinking days and all the days that follow one day at a time sober I wouldn't trade it intentionally and go backwards but you know what we're all in the same boat in the same day same pressures and catastrophes can happen and so far there have been quite a few catas catastrophes for me loss of everything and then starting again in some ways it felt better to do that but I wasn't doing it intentionally that's how it happened and that ringer is extremely painful and how many times do we really really want to go through it so emotional feelings all the feelings not suppressing them it takes a while for those to work themselves through and then to be able to live our feelings feeling things in the moment of now emotional and spiritual well-being as best we can we'll always have those I can't believe it moments and I can't believe it's horrible tragic and awful well I can't believe it's so good I just can't believe it denial is part of us so it's not a bad thing unless it's unless it's ongoing all the time about who we are and what we can do enough and at the end of these videos as I, I always share the serenity prayer which is about spiritual well-being as much as anything else to the God of your understanding or simply good conscience or a higher power that you perceive works for you good or lead drunks whatever it happens to be to God or good conscience God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference for me is just for today